Hello and welcome to the fourth and final part of the Parliamentary Review of the Year. Our look at the big stories, the controversies and the dramas of 1999, with a brief look into the crystal ball to see what Westminster 2000 might have in store. Coming up in the next half hour, the day John Prescott rather wished he had not been standing in for the Prime Minister. Now where was that answer? The Conservative peer who defied gay rights campaigners and helped to kill the bill on lowering the homosexual age of consent. And William Hague brings the House down at the expense of the Liberal Democrats' new leader, Charles Kennedy. Well, if William Hague made arguably the funniest speech of the year, John Prescott gave what was generally regarded as the worst parliamentary performance. To quote one scribe, it was terrible, ghastly, chaotic, miserable, and floor-staringly, mouth-puckeringly embarrassing. Mr Prescott, standing in for the Prime Minister, got questions muddled up and was confused over the difference between the European withholding tax and the poll tax. In view of the very firm commitments given by the Chancellor of the Exchequer and by the Economic Secretary to the Treasury Select Committee, would the uh, Deputy Prime Minister give an absolute guarantee that the withholding tax will not be introduced in this country? As someone who is now the Secretary of State for Environment, a disastrous poll tax is one that I'm constantly having, having to deal with. It's one I am constantly having to deal with. And I, I, I think the honourable member should bear in mind that what we have now settled with the local authorities is the most generous settlement they have ever received. And there was worse to come when the House moved to question number seven, whether the Prime Minister was going to visit the new national forest. Mr Prescott couldn't find his answer. <laughs> there are different ways of doing it at different times. <laughs> Questions. Mike, it's the way I tell him, just hang on. Well, if that was John Prescott's worst hour, he also That's figured in William Hague's finest, if only as the butt the of one of a string of jokes about the contents of the Queen's speech. <laughs> but Mr Hague began with a swipe at the new Liberal Democrat leader, Charles Kennedy, and a welcome for what was missing from the Queen's speech. For instance, any measure to meet the Prime Minister's manifesto commitment to hold a referendum on proportional representation in this parliament. The poor old Liberal Party. They behave themselves all year, not saying boo to a goose. They look cheerfully expectant on days like this. And what do they get in return? Nothing. What a shame that the Liberal leader has gone in a few short months from have I got news for you to I'm sorry, I haven't a clue. <laughs> then a dig at Tony Blair's problems over the campaign by Ken Livingstone to become London Mayor. And after the shambles we've seen in London in the last few days, I don't know how the Prime Minister could write into the Queen's speech with a straight face. My government will make it easier for people to participate in elections. <laughs> it must be. That's what it says must be the first instance of something being put in the Queen's speech entirely as a joke. But if, <laughs> but if he's finding it so difficult, I have a solution for him. Why doesn't he split the job of Mayor for London? The former Health Secretary can run as his day mayor and the Honourable Member for Brenties can run as his nightmare. <laughs> Then the boot went into Mr Prescott, who was accused of using the transport bill to declare war on motorists. This bill will do nothing to ease the chaos on Britain's roads, little to improve public transport alternatives. It is a vicious stealth tax assault on car drivers. For Mondeo man, once so cherished by new Labour spin doctors, it is another kick in the teeth. People work hard and save hard to own a car. They don't want to be told they can't drive it by a Deputy Prime Minister whose idea of a park-and-ride scheme is to park one Jaguar in order to ride away in the other. <laughs> the speech was widely seen as Mr Hague's best since becoming Tory leader and was followed by an opinion poll suggesting that a Conservative recovery might be underway. But Tory jubilation was short-lived. The resignation of Lord Archer plunged the party back into fresh crisis and the announcement of an impending Downing Street baby only added to Tory spin doctor's woes. So, back to the drawing board then. Well, here in our newsroom at the BBC, I have with me Matthew Paris from The Times, who's been writing some end-of-term reports for us. Matthew, not a great year for John Prescott. A signally bad year for John Prescott, possibly 
a terminal year. Uh, all his career he's been bumping into the English language, but standing in for the Prime Minister he has really been floundering hilariously around, bumping into the mispronunciation of foreign names, uh, bumping into the order of questions and giving the right answer to the wrong question or the wrong answer to the right question. Nobody was sure. William Hague is a terrific performer in the House of Commons. Why doesn't it rub off on him as Conservative Party leader? If you want to know why William Hague's good performances at the dispatch box don't uh, rub off in terms of his leadership of the party, move the camera away from William Hague to the Drongo's misfits and generally dysfunctional people around him called the Conservative Party. Nobody can lead that crowd. The Prime Minister's question is going to become more and more important as we run up to the next general election. Does Tony Blair still have the upper hand um, at Prime Minister's questions because the Prime Minister is normally so well briefed? Tony Blair always starts with the upper hand because the Prime Minister does. He often doesn't finish Prime Minister's questions with the upper hand. He gets rattled. He doesn't like people being rude to him. He's not used to being spoken to disrespectfully and he's not good at absorbing massive uh, civil servants' briefs as uh, Margaret Thatcher was, so he often gets out of his depth. William Hague gets the better of him quite a lot. Anne Widdicombe has been fairly omnipresent in the House of Commons this year. Is she going to be canonised next year in the year 2000? Anne Widdicombe is riding for something. It could well be canonisation. She thinks it might be leadership of the party. It could also be a hell of a fall. Nobody knows. What have been the sort of big moments for you for in, the, in uh, 1999? The House has lacked big moments, partly because the government has made damn sure to keep big moments away from the Chamber of the Commons, sneaking everything awkward out with little press releases beforehand. For me, the most moving moment was uh, the obvious tears in Tony Benn's eyes as his son, Hilary Benn, was introduced as a Member of Parliament into the House of Commons. And another sad moment has been uh, to see Dennis Skinner increasingly away from the Chamber. He has been the best attender in years and he's not well and it, it, it may be that uh, Dennis Skinner's performances too will not, not go on at least in the chamber for very much longer. What was the entry back into the House of Commons of Michael Portillo like? It is possible that, that uh, in the uh, millennium ahead we're going to be looking back on the entry of Michael Portillo right at the end of 1999. The, it was a magnificent occasion. The Tories so excited they could hardly speak. Everybody agitated. Nobody thinking about what was happening as the great man, his proud quiff erect, strode into the chamber and uh, took the oath. All that was missing was poor old Dennis Skinner, who I think was not well, who could have punctured the entire occasion with one of those heckles. It was not to be. And possibly some dramatic music. That would have been rather good to cover it as well. And a quarter of a mile down the committee room corridor uh, in the House of Lords, we've seen all all the old crusty earls and countesses disappear as well, with only 92 hereditary peers remaining. Um, the, do you miss them as a sketch writer? Do you I, miss them? I shall miss them a lot. I mean, there was that wonderful moment when the Earl of Burford, or whatever his name is, leapt onto the woolsack and uh, declaimed, I shall never see that again in the Lords, and I think we shall never see their like again. Matthew Paris, thanks very much indeed. Pleasure. From personalities to issues, and it would be difficult to find two more contentious subjects than the proposal to cut some incapacity benefit and the campaign to reduce the age of consent for gay men. One bill narrowly survived a savage mauling, the other didn't. For the second year running, a move to reduce the age of consent for homosexual men to 16 was blocked by the House of Lords. A bill to equalise the age of consent received a large majority in the Commons. It is essential and it is crucial to have an equal age of consent to protect our young people, yeah. to give them value, to let them grow emotionally, to let them grow with self-esteem, yeah. to let them have a youth, to let them have a youth that they can talk about. And the Lords heard from one peer about what it was like to be gay at 16. For me tonight, this isn't an academic, intellectual or even a theological debate, because between the ages of 16 to 21, I suffered under this law. I was made to keep my relationship secret from my employers, from my friends, and yes, my lords, even from my family. To create that level of fear in anyone so young is unforgivable. But the bill was killed when peers supported the arguments of its main critic. I believe that in public right life, one must stand up for those things which one believes to be right and believes to be true. Yeah. and that I would be failing in my duty if I did not do so. Yeah. 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 I believe that in voting against the second reading of this bill, we shall be supporting and helping young people. 
We shall be supporting and helping good and responsible parents. We shall be supporting the institution of marriage, which is under threat and is causing a great deal of the breakdown of society as we see it today. And above all, we shall be reflecting what the public want. Alistair, Alistair, what are you going to do? Plans to cut some incapacity benefits produced a marathon session of parliamentary ping-pong between MPs and peers. Critics in the Lords finally surrendered at the 11th hour, but only after a series of government defeats in the Upper House and backbench rebellions in the Commons. It will be the first time I have not supported my own party in all of my time in Parliament, and I say that of the party I love. My Lords, the House should reject completely the implicit policy that poor disabled people should be forced to pay for very poor disabled people. That's the job of wealthy people, or indeed of the general taxpayer. Anybody voting to scupper this is voting for the House of Lords to prevail right. over the House yeah. of Commons. Yeah. I go further, Mr Deputy Speaker, I go further. Anybody voting Anybody voting for this amendment tonight is voting on the same side as two dukes, 28 earls, 22, 22 viscounts and Andrew Lloyd Webber. Apart from the provisions on incapacity benefit, this is a fine bill. I wish it Godspeed and I beg leave to withdraw. Is it your Lordship's pleasure that this motion be withdrawn? Motion by leave withdrawn. President Clinton once famously remarked, it's the economy, stupid. A thought which seems to have done the Chancellor no end of good in the popularity stakes. If opinion polls are to be believed, this is the year that Gordon Brown became the most popular Chancellor in a generation. Even more popular, if that's possible, than Tony Blair. A reputation partly enhanced, no doubt, by his budget announcements on tax cuts. In fact, to reward work and ensure working families are better off, I will match the new 10p starting rate of income tax this April with a cut from next April in the basic rate of income tax to 22 pence, the lowest rate of tax for 70 years and under this government. And here is the Chancellor now, posing as the man who likes to distribute a few little goodies when he has imposed when he has imposed for the current year a huge rise in tax rate. He is the man who says, he is the man you meet in the pub who says, lend us a fiver and then I'll buy you a drink. He is the, he is the pickpocket chancellor sh who shakes your hand with a smile after he has stealthily removed your wallet. It seems to me that the chancellor has once again made a selective smash and grab raid on some of our bright ideas and our proposals, yeah. and they uh, feature here in considerable number. This is what the Tories have called them. Eight months later, Gordon Brown was back with a statement setting the scene for his next budget and grabbing the headlines, this time with good news for elderly pensioners. From next autumn, pensioners 75 or over, every pensioner aged 75 or more will receive their television licence free of charge. Yeah. At a cost of £300 million a year, every one of the three million households with a pensioner over 75 will be able to save £101 a year. But taxation continues to be the main bone of contention. Labour said the overall tax burden was falling, while the Conservatives said it was going up. Can he not understand that the experience of increased taxation is not just a matter of statistics, it's the daily experience of people who pay for their petrol and their pensions and have a marriage and a mortgage? I believe that our spending policies are right. They're exactly right. Not a penny more, not a penny less. <laughs> A work of fiction, of course, by one Lord Geoffrey Archer. Well, with me now to discuss all this are the Labour MP Gwyneth Dunwoody, the former Conservative Cabinet Minister John McGregor, and the Liberal Democrats' elder statesman Ming Campbell. Uh, let's start with the economy, John McGregor. Um, a year ago, it was hard to find a Conservative who wasn't um, prophesying um, a vast recession um, for our economy, and it hasn't happened, has it? Why did well, you get I, it wrong? I, I wasn't one of them because I actually think that the legacy that the Labour government inherited was a hugely strong economy. 
uh, and they have made a number of decisions along the lines of what we were pursuing, and I welcome that. I think that's a good thing. I mean, a lot of their economic decisions have been very much the Tory type of policy approach before, which they used to criticize, but which they're now following, and that's given a strength in the economy. The problem is that there are quite a few little time bombs ticking away now, which I think are going to create some considerable troubles in the next year or so uh, on, on pensions, uh, on all these stealth taxes, which are taking a lot of money out of industry, uh, on some of the effect, effects on rural areas, for example, of the fuel duty escalators and so on. So there are a number of issues coming up, which I think uh, are going to cause general problems, but, but overall, because of the inheritance and the strong change in the economy because of the reforms we undertook, uh, the position is still not bad. I mean, John McGregor's problems notwithstanding, Ling Campbell, Gordon Brown really has managed to bury once and for all Labour's image, traditional image, as not being safe with the economy. Well, of course, that's the determination of people in the Labour Party of Gordon Brown's generation, determination to try and establish Labour as having sound economic policies assisted certainly by many of the decisions which Kenneth Clark, his predecessor, took, but also assisted, of course, by adopting the Liberal Democrat policy of making of the Bank of England independent, something he said all the way throughout the last general election campaign he had no intention of doing. There's no doubt that uh, Gordon Brown is, uh, if you like, obsessed by prudence, uh, but I think there's a point reached at which that obsession stands in the way of proper expenditure on health and education, and it's in these two great public services that public discontent is likely to be most focused, unless there's a greater amount of investment than we've seen so far from this government. Great. Well, it's very interesting, isn't it? I mean, according to John, it's all the things that Kenneth did, and according to Ming, it's all the things that uh, uh, were done on the Liberal Democrats' decision. I mean, it's a load of nonsense. It's actually a very strong economy. It's doing very well. Uh, Gordon, uh, I don't know who this woman Prudence is, but I'm not always one of our well, great Gordon supporters. Gordon Brown's got billions and billions of pounds Absolutely. saved up, or so we're told. Help Absolutely. him spend it. What would you spend well, it on Well, firstly, that? of course, we're, we're waiting to see the result, which I think will be a real result on changing the whole reality of low-paid families on family tax credits. And, and that's certainly, happen? yes, it's happening now. You can actually begin to see the gap between women and men workers very slowly changing and that's tremendously important the business of actually making sure that low paid workers get a proper rate of pay that has transformed the lives of all sorts of people sounds like a fairer society really john McGregor. but there are problems coming up as i say he's taken five billion pounds a year out of occupational pension funds uh, we're going to see companies uh, realising the consequences of that increasingly and in due course pensioners. A lot he's, of companies, of course, uh, for a long time have had straightforward but, but pension Gw holidays. No, but Gwyneth, I can, I can assure you, I can assure you, a lot of them are going, I can assure you, a lot of them are going to find now that all of that's changed and it's going to be a much They've more had serious a good run. They're also going to move out of occupational pension schemes, the, the, the traditional ones. Uh, so that's one area. I think a lot of the regulations that have come in, we've had an over-regulated approach by government uh, in the last two years. So the Working Time Directive and a number of things that have actually flown sometimes from Brussels as well because they, they, they didn't opt out. All of those are going to have a niggling effect on a lot of companies and therefore on a lot of people's jobs. So there are problems uh, and uh, th these are the problems of the government's own making. Mm. I mean, there's no doubt there's been an increase in taxation by stealth. Now, I happen to believe in what you might call honest taxation. If you're taking money from people for, p for the purpose of the public purse, then you really ought to tell them how you're I doing agree. it so yes. people understand they That's may right. not be paying any more on the basic rate of income tax, but the f if the provision which they're making for their pension has been adversely affected, as in this case, by the removal of the regime that. with regard to advanced corporation tax, then people are entitled to know it may not affect them now, but it will certainly affect them when they come to draw their pensions. Well, do, you cringe, do you cringe a little bit when uh, you see Gordon Brown in the House of Commons come up with some of these extraordinary um, helpful uh, measures as far as the economy is concerned? Things if, like if the I pensioners' cringe, TV licenses. It's license because they haven't. No, I mean, why haven't they taken more credit for the things that they have done? The minimum wage is something that really ought to be known in this country years and years ago. And the kind of positive benefits that we've brought in, which will transform the lives of a lot of people at the bottom end of the scale, even the grants of things like £100 to pensioners mm. to help with their fuel bills in the winter, they're not negligible. They may be things that many of us would like to see expanded, but nevertheless, they are terribly well, important. Could, these I are say, could I just say, actually, in my constituency, which is a very rural area, it doesn't look like that. Uh, what's happened to a lot of people is the fuel du duty escalator, which has been much increased and by which Gordon your government Brown, brought much in. increased by Gordon Brown, and I, I've been criticising for two years for it. That's taking.
taking a lot of income away from people uh, and leaving them in a net uh, worse off position. But they will, That's many of them are very in low schools, pay. I'm getting a lot of schools Many now of them are very I, low pay. Gonna, just let me finish. I'm getting a lot of schools now complaining uh, that they're not seeing this education, 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 because actually the increase in educational spending each year is less under Gordon Brown than it was under us. Let's leave Gordon Brown alone for a moment and talk about the Queen's speech and uh, this new legislative programme we've got ahead of us. I mean, Campbell, um, we know what wasn't in it. What wasn't in it was PR for Westminster elections. Yeah, deeply disappointing. Deeply well, deeply disappointing, but we'll go on making the case. Uh, the government committed itself to having a referendum on proportional representation. I expect the government to meet its obligations, so too will the British public. But I think some of the things which are in the Queen's speech are going to cause quite a lot of trouble for the government in the coming year. Such as what? Well, the abolition of trial by jury, the attempt to privatise air traffic control, things of that kind go right to the very heart of the kind of society we live in. And I think the government's going to have a lot of trouble getting these measures onto the statute book. And so it should, because the right to trial by jury has been an integral part of the English legal system for a very long time. To take it away for what are essentially administrative or financial reasons is hardly justified. Gwyneth Dunwoody, we've, we know what's in the Queen's speech. For you, what should have been in the Queen's speech but wasn't? I know. Well, I'm a heavens. When you get 26 or 28 bills, I shouldn't have think there's much you left out, including the kitchen sink. That's fine. I occasionally think it would be very nice if we... I'd like to have seen something on corporate manslaughter, because those of us who deal with people who are killed on the roads and remember some of the terrible cases there were where people were really responsible either That might for be a subject for private of, members' legislation. Yeah, but it's also, it's also worth looking at from the point of view. And I think that there are a lot of things that could be done, certainly to improve the standards in some of the health uh, service uh, provisions, but a lot of it is not only very imaginative, but it's actually going quite well. What does your Queen's speech look like, John? Well, Murray? I think it looks fairly... I mean, there are a lot of bills, but a lot of them are pretty technical. So I think the focus in Parliament in the next year is going to be on other things than the legislation. Certainly the, the transport bill is going to get a lot of attention, uh, but, the, but the bit that's missing there is, of course, that uh, John Prescott's hugely cut back the road programme, so the motorist is now facing not only much higher fuel duty uh, taxes, but also facing congestion because the, simply the bypasses and the, the improvements to existing roads haven't taken place. He's, been, he's slashed it completely and now proposing to use extra fuel duty to put at least some of it back. Now, there's going to be a big focus on that. I think there'll be uh, quite a substantial focus also in the pension area. Housing benefits, it looks as though any decisions on that are going to be postponed. So a lot, I think a lot of the, the issues that will be dominating parliamentary time will not be in the legislation themselves. I mm. tell you what I think this Queen's speech tells us, that the general election is almost certainly going to be in the spring of 2001. I think this is a technical Queen's speech mm. designed to get a few technical, more than a few technical measures onto the statute book of at all possible to leave space for the traditional glad handing it's and the traditionally attractive measures it's for yeah. you, which, it's which, which tend to occupy the legislative calendar immediately before general election. But it's found you disagreeing with an awful lot of measures the government's proposing now where you weren't say two and a half years ago just after the general election. Well we disagree with measures on their merits. Uh, I mean if the government proposes something which is consistent with Liberal Democrat policy and principle is and is, and is in the interest of the people of the country, I'll support that. But where the government proposes measures which seem to me to be wholly contrary to these principles, then I'll oppose it as much as I possibly can. And I would agree with that. I think the Freedom of informa Information Bill actually is a very good example of a bill that was uh, right in, in theory and principle and very, very falling down in practice. Well, we'll, a lot of we'll have to see. We'll have to see. But you didn't even bring it in. We'll have to but see. I mean, the simple thing is you start we with a bill. We did a huge number of other things. Ah, oh, yes, yeah, but you didn't we'll want people see. to know what was going on. We'll have to see whether there's a freedom of information bill that works in Scotland and one that doesn't work in England. Yeah, that's uh, something that's going to have, we're going to have to be argued about later. Um, looking into the year 2000, um, the, I mean, the Tories have managed, really, to completely dominate the whole of the the 20th century, really. Um, do you think that Blair uh, has done enough to make sure that Labour dominate the next century? Well, you? if you look at the support he has amongst the electorate as a whole, it's very clear that he's taken the majority of the British people with him and that the difficulties that are arising are arising where people want to argue about specific angles of policy, not necessarily the basic policy. 
I think that uh, the millennium will be very interesting simply because all sorts of exciting things will happen. I think someone should think of an alternative to the combustion engine. I want to see <laughs> all sorts of really useful things happening I mean, inside. Tony Blair's going to have to pull his finger out. If he's <laughs> no, it exists already. What we, want, what we want is some more support that, for that's, science that's in this again, country. That's again the Labour Party anti-car attitude coming. You've got, <laughs> um, you've got Tony Blair um, the magician too. <laughs> um, you, you've got uh, your work cut out, haven't you, to fight this huge Labour engine I think um, what we're going to see in the next year or so is this. In the last two and a half years, we've had uh, Labour with a huge parliamentary majority, largely bypassing Parliament in many ways. Uh, I think Parliament's going to become much more important again in the year ahead. Because, really? Well, you'll give fairer time to all parties, won't you? Because they're moving up into and the some election of you period might when you'll up. do this. When you'll do this. So you'll give, you'll give much more time to the opposition. Uh, and we will be actually in a position, as I agree with Ming, I think we're moving up into a, a pre-election atmosphere. Uh, and that's when you can actually score. That's when we can really draw attention to the things that simply haven't happened in the last two and a half years. Uh, inevitably, when they came in, they were given a honeymoon period. But there's mm. a lot that hasn't happened, and we will now focus Long on Long old that. honeymoon, though. I mean, I don't want to put words into your mouth, right. Ming Campbell, but I mean, I should <laughs> think... But you're going to. I'm going to try, <laughs> try to, yeah. Yes. Um, I think probably Gwyneth Dunwoody and John McGregor wouldn't necessarily like to be in your position in the, in the run-up to the next election. With 43 seats to, to hang on to? Well, 46 as it happens. 46. Uh, 46 uh, but a new leader, different style, different approach. You know, Who's I'd not quite um, well, got off to the start we've okay. heard. I mean, he's only been doing the job for four weeks, for heaven's sake. Uh, I mean, this is a man of great talent, great ability. I've no doubt he's going to, in his own way, be just as successful as any of his predecessors. But as for the Conservatives, one has to say this that Mr. Haig may be impressive inside the House of Commons. But until he's able to exercise judgment on a whole range of things, he's not going to attract the sort of support from people outside of the House of Commons, which is necessary for any kind of Tory revival. Is the opportunities um, for us, as a result of that, are very considerable indeed. Is the 21st century going to see Michael Portillo as British Prime Minister? I think it would be worth £100 at 25 to 1. Gwyneth? Against or for? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. The Conservative Party do consistently make mistakes, but I don't think they're going to make that one. You don't see him as being a, a real threat. That's not why your party has been targeting him so viciously. And uh, I in have this, to tell you that Mr. Campaign. Portillo, on his own account, is not head of everybody's uh, popularity list, and. Uh, I mean, it's really a matter of the Conservative Party. I don't see a Conservative Prime Minister really for a very long time, and I think that by the time he gets round to it, it might be somebody else. Would you vote for I him? I think you'll eat your words on that uh, at some point. Let uh -huh. me just take up Ming's point, actually, which is, which is this, really, that I remember that uh, after about two years of Margaret Thatcher being leader of the opposition, a lot of the comments that were made now about William were made about her, and she turned out to be one of the outstanding Prime Ministers for the longest time uh, in this century. So watch this so, space, so William so Hague, when you Thatcher. <laughs> Thatcher, Mark II. What a way to begin the year. <laughs> well, well, I, don't, I mean, I'm just so absolutely amazed at this great degree of unreality that I'm quite enjoying it. Mm, good. Well, I, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, they just arrived time for me to thank my guests, Gwyneth Dunwoody, Mingus Campbell and John McGregor from Westminster for now. Goodbye.